Hello, and welcome to my channel, Reading Little Blue Books Out Loud. This is a little blue book. It happens to be Little Blue Book number 700, and it is entitled, or titled, A Guide to Schopenhauer, written by Will Durant, Ph.D. And this is a, this is a thicker one for Little Blue Books. And let's see, does it have a copyright? Oh yeah, copyright 1924. And there's a table of contents. Chapter 1 is the age. Chapter 2 is the man. 3, the world as idea. 4, the world as will. Under that is the will of will to live and the will to reproduce. Five is the will the world as evil. Six, the wisdom of life. And under that is philosophy, genius, art, and religion. Seven, the wisdom of death. And eight, criticism. So let's get started. Okay, here we go. Oh, there's a picture of the fella. Well, I wouldn't say a picture. There's a sketch. Let's see if we can get it. There it is. There is Arthur Schopenhauer himself. Look at that hair. Okay. Arthur Schopenhauer. A Guide to Schopenhauer. Chapter 1. The Age. Why is it that the first half of the 19th century lifted up, as voices of the age, a group of pessimi pessimistic poets, Byron in England, de Musset in France, Haney in Germany, Leopardi in Italy, Pushkin and Lermontov in Russia, a group of pessimistic composers, Schubert, Schumann, Chopin, and even the later Beethoven, a pessimist trying to convince himself that he is an optimist. And above all, a profoundly pessimistic philosopher, Arthur Schopenhauer. The great anthology of Woe, The World as Will and Idea, appeared in 1818. It was the age of the Holy Alliance. Waterloo had been fought, the revolution was dead, and the sun of the revolution was rotting on a rock in a distant sea. Something of Schopenhauer's apotheosis of will was due to that magnificent and bloody apparition of the will made flesh in a little Corsican. And something of his despair of life from the pathetic distance of St. Helena. Will defeated at last and dark death the only victor of all the wars. The Bourbons were restored. The feudal barons were returned to claim their lands. And the Pacific idealism of Alexander had unwittingly mothered a league for the suppression of progress everywhere. The great age was over. I thank God, said Goethe, that I am not young and so thoroughly finished a world. All Europe lay prostrate. Millions of strong men had perished. Millions of acres of land had been neglected or laid waste. Everywhere on the continent, life had, be life had to begin again at the bottom, to recover painfully and slowly the criticizing, the civilizing economic surplus that had been swallowed up in war. Schopenhauer, traveling through France and Austria in 1804, was struck by the chaos and uncleanliness of the villages, the wretched poverty of the farmers, the unrest and misery of the towns, the passage of the Napoleonic and counter-Napoleonic armies had left scars of ravage on the face of every country. Moscow was in ashes, and England a proud victor in the strife the farmers were ruined by the fall of the price of wheat, and the industrial workers were tasting all the horrors of the nascent and uncontrolled factory system. 
demobilizing ad demobilization added to unemployment. I have heard my father say, wrote Carlyle, that in the years when oatmeal was as high as ten shillings a stone, he had noticed the laborers retire each separately to a brook, and there drink instead of dining, anxious only to hide their misery from one another. I never had life seem so meaningless or so mean. I'm going to pause there just for a moment. Okay, we're back. Yes, the revolution was dead, and with it the life seemed to have gone out of the soul of Europe. That new heaven, called Utopia, whose glamour had re relieved the twilight of the gods, had receded into a dim future where only young eyes could see it. The old ones had followed that lore long enough and turned away from it now as a mockery of men's hopes. Only the young can live in the future, and only the old can live in the past. Men were most of them forced to live in the present, and the present was a ruin. How many thousands of heroes and believers had fought for the revolution? How the hearts of youth everywhere in Europe had turned toward the young republic and had lived on the light and hope of it, until Beethoven tore into shreds of dedication of his heroic symphony to the man who had ceased to be the son of the revolution and had become the son-in-law of reaction. Come on, pages, turn. How many had fought, even then, for the great hope, and had believed with passionate uncertainty to that very end? And now, here was the very end. Waterloo, and St. Helena, and Vienna, and on the throne of prostate France, a Bourbon, who had learned nothing and forgotten nothing. This was the glorious denouncement of a generation of such hope and effort as human history had never known before. What a comedy this tragedy was, for those whose laughter was yet bitter with tears. Many of the poor had, in these days of disillusionment and suffering, the consolation of religious hope. But a large proportion of the upper class had lost their faith, and looked out upon a ruined world with no alleviating vision of a vaster life in, in whose final justice and beauty these ugly ills would be dissolved. And in truth, it was hard enough to believe that such a sorry planet of men, as men saw in 1818, was held up in the hand of an intelligent and, bene and benevolent God. Metastopheles had triumphed, and every Faust was in despair. Voltaire had sown the whirlwind and Schopenhauer was to reap the harvest. Seldom had the problem of evil been flung so vividly and incessantly into the face of philosophy and religion. Every material grave from Bologna to Moscow and the pyramids lifted a mute interrogation, in, interrogation to the indifferent stars. How long, O oh Lord, and why was this almost universal calamity the vengeance of a just God on the age of reason and unbelief? Was it a call to the penitent in intellect to bend before the ancient virtues of faith, hope, and charity? So Schlegel thought, and Novellus, and Chateaubriand, and de Mossat, and Sothley, and Wads Wordsworth, and Gogol, and they turned back to the old faith like wasted prodigals, happy to be home again. But some others made a harsher answer, that the chaos of Europe but reflected the chaos of the universe, that there was no divine order after all, nor any heavenly hope, that God, if God there was, was blind, and evil brooded over the face of the earth. So Byron and Haney and Lermontov and Leopardi and our philosopher. Chapter 2. The Man. Schopenhauer was born at Danzig 
on February 22nd of 1788. His father was a merchant, merchant noted for ability, hot temper, independence of character, and love of liberty. He moved from Danzig to Hamburg when Arthur was five years old. Because Danzig lost its freedom in the annexation of Poland in 1793. Young Schopenhauer, therefore, grew up in the midst of business and finance, and though he soon abandoned the mercantile career into which his father had pushed him, it left its mark upon him in a certain bluntness of manner, a realistic turn of mind, a knowledge of the world and of men. It made him the antipodes of that closet or academic type of philosopher whom he so despised. The father died, apparently, by his own hand in 1805. The parental grandmother had died insane. The character or will, says Schopenhauer, Schopenhauer is inherited from the father, the intellect from the mother. The mother had intellect. She became one of the most popular novelists of her day. But she had temperament and temper, too. She had been unhappy with her prosaic husband. And when he died, she took to free love and moved to Weimar as the fittest climate for that sort of life. Arthur Schopenhauer reacted to this as Hamlet to his mother's remarriage, and his quarrels with his mother taught him a large part of those half-truths about women with which he was to season his philosophy. One of her letters to him reveals the state of their affairs. You are unbearable and burdensome and very hard to live with. All your good qualities are overshadowed by your conceit and made useless to the world simply because you cannot restrain your propensity to pick holes in other people. So they arranged to live apart. He was to come only to her at homes and be one guest among others. They could then be as polite to each other as strangers instead of hating each other like relatives. Goethe, who liked M. Schopenhauer because she let him bring his Christina with him, made matters worse by telling the mother that her son would become a very famous man. The mother had never heard of two geniuses in the same family. Finally, in some Culminating quarrel, the mother pushed her son and rival down the stairs, whereupon her philosopher bitter, bitterly informed her that she would be known to posterity only through him. Schopenhauer quieted Weimar soon afterward, quitted Weimar soon afterward, and though the mother lived 24 years more, he never saw her again. Byron, also a child of 1788, seems to have had similar luck with his mother. These men were almost by this circumstance doomed to pessimism. A man who has not known a mother's love, and worse has known a mother's hatred, has no cause to be inf infatuated with the world. Meanwhile, Schopenhauer had gone through gymnasium and university and had learned more than was on his schedules. He came away with a venereal taint which affected his character and his philosophy. He became gloomy, cynical, and suspicious. He was obsessed with fears and evil fancies. He kept his pipes under lock and key and never trusted his neck to the barber's razor and he slept with loaded pistols at his bedside, presumably for the convenience of the burglar. He could not bear noise. I have long held the opinion, he writes, that the amount of noise which anyone can bear undisturbed stands in, in inverse proportion to his mental capacity, and may therefore be regarded as a pretty fair measure of it. Noise is a torture to all intellectual people. This superabundant display of vitality, which takes the form of knocking, hammering, and tumbling things about, has proved a daily torment to me all my life long. He had an almost paranoic sense of unrecognized greatness. Missing success and fame, he turned within and gnarled at his own soul. 
He had no mother, no wife, no child, no family, no country. He was absolutely alone, with not a single friend, and between one and none there lies an infinity. Even more than Goethe, he was immune to the natural, nationalistic fevers of his age. In 1813, he so far fell under the sway of Fitche's enthusiasm for a war of liberation against Napoleon that he thought of volunteering and actually bought a set of arms. But prudence seized him in time. He argued that Napoleon gave, after all, only concentrated and on an untrammeled utterance to that self-assertion and lust for more life which weaker mortals fill but must perforce disguise instead of going to war he went to the country <laughs> and wrote a doctor's thesis in philosophy after this dissertation on the fourfold root of sufficient reason 1813 Schopenhauer gave all his time and devoted all his power to the work which was to be his masterpiece, the world as will and idea. He sent the MS to the publisher, Magna Cum Laude. Here, he said, was no mere rehash of old ideas, but a highly coherent structure of original thought, clearly intelligible, vigorous, and not with beauty, a book which would hereafter be the source and occasion of a hundred other books, all of which was outrageously egotistic and absolutely true. Many years later, Schopenhauer was so sure of having solved the chief problems of philosophy that he thought of having his signet ring carved with an image of the Sphinx throwing himself down the abyss, as she had promised to do on having the ri her riddles answered. Nevertheless, the book attracted hardly any attention. The world was too poor and exhausted to read about its poverty and exhaustion. Sixteen years after publication, Schopenhauer was informed that the greater part of the edition had been sold as waste paper. In his essay on fame and the wisdom of life, he quotes, with evident allusion to his masterpiece, two remarks of Lichtenberger's. Works like this are as a mirror if an ass looks in, you cannot expect an angel to look out. And when a head and a book come into collision and one sounds hollow, it is always the book. Schopenhauer goes on with a voice of wounded vanity. The more a man belongs to posterity, in other words, to humanity in general, so much the more is he an alien to his contemporaries. For since his work is not meant for them as such, but only in so far as they form part of mankind at large, there is none of that familiar local color about his productions which would appeal to them. And then he become, becomes as eloquent as the fox in the fable. Would a musician feel flattered by the loud applause of an audience if he knew that they were nearly all deaf? And that, he, and that to conceal their infirmity, he saw one or two persons applaud. Applauding. And what would he say if he discovered that those one or two persons had often taken bribes to secure the loudest applause for the poorest player? In some men, egotism is a compensation for the ab absence of fame. In others, egotism lends a generous cooperation to its presence. So completely did Schopenhauer put himself into this book that his later works are but commentaries on it. He became Talm Talmudist to his own Torah, exegete to his own Jeremiads. In 1836, he published, published pardon me, published an essay on the will in nature, which was to some degree incorporated into the enlarged edition of the world as will and idea, which appeared in 1844. In 1841 came the two ground problems of ethics, and in 1851, two substantial volumes, a peri, peri, 
Periga et Paralimpona, literally, byproducts and leavings, which have been translated into English as the essays. For this, the most readable of his works, and replete with wisdom and wit, Schopenhauer received for his total rumination ten free copies. <laughs> Optimism is difficult under such circumstances. Only one adventure disturbed the monotony of his studious seclusion after leaving Weimar. He had hoped for a chance to present his philosophy at one of the great universities of Germany. The chance came in 1922 when he was invited to Berlin as private docent. He deliberately chose for his lectures the very hours at which the then mighty Hegel was scheduled to teach. Schopenhauer trusted that the students would view him and Hegel with the eyes of posterity, but the students could not so far anticipate, and Schopenhauer found himself talking to empty seats. He resigned and revenged himself by those bitter diatribes against Hegel, which mar the later editions of his Chef d'Orvers. In 1831, a cholera epidemic broke out in Berlin. Both Hegel and Schopenhauer fled. Hegel returned prematurely, caught the infection, and died in a few days. Schopenhauer never stopped until he reached Frankfurt, which he spent the remainder of his 72 years. Like a sensible pessimist, he had avoided that pitfall of optimist, the attempt to make a living with the pen. He had inherited an in interest in his father's firm and lived in modest comfort on the revenue which this brought him. He invested his money with a wisdom on becoming a philosopher. When a company in which he had taken shares failed and other, the other creditors agreed to a 70% settlement, Schopenhauer fought for full payment and won. He had enough to engage upon he had enough to engage two rooms in a boarding house. There he lived the last 30 years of his life. With no comrade but a dog, he called the little poodle Atma, the Brahmin's term for the world's soul. But the wags of the town called it Young Schopenhauer. He ate his dinners usually at the Englisher, Englisher Hof. At the beginning of each meal, he would put a gold coin upon the table before him, and at the end of each meal, he would put the coin back into his pocket. It was, no doubt, an indignant waiter who at last asked him the meaning of this invariable ceremony. Schopenhauer answered that it was his silent wager to drop the coin into the poor box on the first day that the English officers dining there should talk of anything else, anything else than horses, women, or dogs. The universities ignored him and his books as if to substantiate his claims that all advances in philosophy are made outside of academic walls. Nothing, says Nietzsche, so offended the German savants as Schopenhauer's unlikeness to them. He, But he had learned some patience. He was confident that, however blatantly, recogn however bl belated, recognition would come. And at last, slowly it came. Men of the middle classes, lawyers, physicians, merchants, found in him a philosopher who offered them no mere pretentious jargon or metaphysical unrealities, but an intelligible survey of the phenomena of actual life. A Europe dis disillusioned with the ideals and efforts of 1848 turned almost with acclamation to the philosophy that had voiced the despair of 1815, the attack of science upon theology, the socialist indictment of poverty and war, the biological stress on the struggle for existence. All these factors helped to lift Schopenhauer finally to fame. He was not too old to enjoy his popularity. He read with he read with av avidity all the articles that appeared about him. He asked his friends to send him every bit of printed comment they could find. He would pay the postage. In 1854, 
Wagner sent him a copy of Der Ring des Nibelungen with a word in appreciation of Schopenhauer's philosophy of music. So the great pessimist became almost an optimist in his old age. He played the flute assiduously after dinner and thanked time for ridding him of the fires of youth. People came from all over the world to see him, and on his 70th birthday in 1858, congratulations poured in upon him from all quarters of every continent. It was not too soon. He had but two more years to live. On September 21st of 1860, he sat down alone to breakfast, apparently well. An hour later, his landlady found him still seated at the table, dead. And I think we'll stop there for part one of A Guide to Schopenhauer.